Oh, great. Do we have any listeners? It's you and I. <laughs> I have a question here. How many, how many tests do you have for hyperbole and how would you rate the test coverage compared to other packages? Well, that's a tricky one. Um, shall I spell it, talk it out loud and then maybe type it at the same time? Um, so I believe it's around like uh, more than 300 test cases now. Uh, but I cannot compare the test coverage to any other package. I have no knowledge of any other package. Uh, maybe I can type that later. Or what do you say, Bandali? Yeah, sure. Yeah, that's totally fine. Feel free to just answer them with voice. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, there's another question. One small suggestion to me should means optional, where shall or must means required. Not sure if it is too late to make a major grammar change like that. Very nice presentation. So thanks for the presentation. But the the, the package ERT, uh, well, it's not some not something that uh, we have come up with. It's a standard package. So uh, I believe it has been around for a long time. So, but please uh, feel free to. Uh, uh, make suggestions and maybe you can you know like do a copy or, or like an alias for that if you believe it makes more sense for your test cases to have that instead and then we have another question here for your info you may find this helpful for running mx test lins both from a command line and from within mx with the transit menu github alpha papa make shell yes uh, it also works on remote CI. Yeah, thank you, Alpha Papa. Uh, I think I really looked into that, uh, but we haven't uh, made any use of that. Uh, uh, but maybe you'll inspire me to give it another look. So. Hey, guys. I remember, I recognize that voice. Hi, Bob. Hey, how are you? Congratulations, I'm, man. I'm, thanks you. Thank you. Uh, I have another question here. It is easy to run ad hoc tests inside an Emacs session. Given the command line scripts you need to run to get the batch test session running. Is it easy to run an ad hoc test? Hmm. I'm not sure I understand that question. Uh, Maybe I can rephrase? Yes, please. Sure. So I, th I think what I understand is that um, since um, you have to use some of these command line uh, scripts to get a batch test session running, um, is it easy to run ad hoc tests in an Emacs session, or does that, like, in your experience, has that been difficult? Uh, well, from from the command line, if you look at the command line, you see that it's only uh, like a few uh, Emacs uh, functions to call to get that behavior to run the the, the, the batch tests. So so. Uh, <clears throat> Um, I think we made have made some support function for that in in hyperbole. So uh, so it's not. I think I don't think it's possible out of the box to do it, but it's not complicated to to uh, uh, to do it. <laughs> but you can define a test any time, right? Just like a new function. So that's what ad hoc. You just write your test and you can run it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, of course, it, but I, I got the impression it was about running all your tests like we did with the command line. Uh, well, so the question is more about how, how would you run all your test cases from uh, within Emacs? And, and uh, the, 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 well, the, the, the easy answer to that is actually you load all your, your, your test case files and then you run ERT with the T as the test selector, and then it will run all your test cases.
Right, and I think they have expanded on their question a little bit as well, clarifying that, in other words, can you tweak tests in an Emacs session and run them right away, which I believe, if I understand correctly what Bob was saying, you can basically define or redefine functions on the fly and then have them be run, right? Yes, yes. You just go into that uh, test case and you just change it and you run it again. And I, I, either you have to sort of load it uh, or you can use like the commercial thing I did. You use hyperbole and just uh, uh, hit meta return on the test case and it will load it and run the, the test case again. So uh, that's of course what you normally do when you define a task or debug a test case or uh, develop a test case. Uh, just start with something small, just make sure maybe you can prepare the test properly and run it again and again and again until you're ready with it. So that's a good, that's a good point. You can definitely do that. And that's part of sort of how I normally develop the test cases that, uh, I mean, start with something small so I can see that I get there maybe the right input in the buffer that I want to test on or something. And then I expand on that more and more and add more and more, uh, more and more tests to, to it. You might, uh, can you hear me? Yeah, uh, loud and clear. You, you might tell them a bit about uh, how many test cases you have. I guess you commented on that and, and like what happens, um, you know, with the CICD pipeline uh, every time we commit, you know, across all the versions and what, what you have set up there because, you know, I wish people could see it. Um, but you can go and check on GitHub and you can see the logs, right, of any of the builds. And, but tell them a bit about that, Matt, because I think that's pretty impressive. Well, that, that's part of more the CI, CD, uh, uh, part of, of how we develop this using GitHub and the workflows that you get out of the box from there. So uh, uh, this... More than 300 test cases on our round for, I think, five different versions of Emacs uh, when we do a pull request or, or a commit. Uh, so so that, that's a good way to ensure that uh, it works at, from version 27.2 up to the latest master version because there's, there's some changes in Emacs over the different versions that can affect your functions <laughs> or your, your code. And they all run in parallel. And so typically in under 60 seconds, I think you've got all of them, all of them run. So you've got pretty extensive uh, testing, uh, which does catch interesting bugs here and there, right? Yes, of course it does. I mean, uh, you normally develop with one version and then uh, you think everything is okay, but then when you test it with the different versions, you find out that there are subtle changes and there are things you do. might not uh, sort of keep track of what's happening also. So you, so you, 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 that's a way to get noticed that uh, the core developers of Emacs have changed something that you sort of based your code on. Then, now I got another question here. Uh, did you have to change hyperbole code and design to be more readily testable as you were increasing your test coverage? Well, we haven't done that to a lot, to a big degree. Uh, although I believe that that is an important thing for sort of the future to do that because some of the hyperbole functions are very complicated and long and that makes testing them rather difficult. So at a few places we have sort of broken up functions in smaller pieces so it'd be easier to do like unit tests of, of the different parts of it so uh, uh, but but uh, there's a lot of more work that it has to be done there one of the nice things is uh you know the great environment of lisp where we're able to do a lot of interactive bottom-up testing uh before we even get to lighting test cases so it does tend to be more uh higher level uh bugs i think that get caught in cross-functional interaction 
We had one recently that was an Emacs version change. It had been a function that had existed for a long time. It had an and rest in it in its argument list. So it would assemble the list of arguments from individual arguments that you would give it. And they decided in a recent version, I think with Stefan's input, to change that to a list and allow the prior behavior, but it would issue a warning if you use the prior behavior. So all of a sudden, the way you were supposed to do it became semi-invalid. And so we started getting the warning, and we've tried to eliminate all those warnings in uh, recent hyperbole developments. So we're like, what do we do? You know, because we want it to be backward compatible to where you couldn't use a list. It required you to use individual arguments. And, and now it's sort of requiring you to do that. And all of that was caused by the by the automatic testing on it. Yeah. <clears throat> so you, you said, Max, you were gonna tell us what you learned. So what are the ma major things that you learned in doing all of this work? Uh, well, well uh, I tried to cover some of it in the presentation, but uh, as I was going along, the presentation became l like twice as long as uh, fitted into the time we had, so I had to cut it, cut it out. So, uh, but I think some of some of the core things still in, is in the presentation. Um, from a personal perspective, and this is, might not be hard to so realize, but uh, forcing yourself to test functions and test code really forces you to to understand the code a little bit better in a way that sort of makes it easier than just to read the code. I don't know if it, it, how it is for, for the rest listening to this, but for me it works so that if I just read the code, then I don't sort of become as sharp as I should be. But if I try to write a test case for it, then I really need to understand better of all the edge cases and all the sort of states and etc. that that is involved. And I think that's that's was sort of a one of the learning things I wanted to communicate as well that I don't, don't think I covered in uh, in detail in, in the presentation. Uh, maybe obvious, but try it. Uh, one other one other sort of more on the, from the fun side is that I really think it's fun to write the test. Right? So if you haven't tests in your test your package, you should start doing that because. Uh, 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 it, 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 is, it, is, it is fun. It might feel uh, like uh, some extra work, but it really pays off in the long run, especially if you have it in uh, like a pipeline where you can run it regularly when you do new commits, etc. So, I mean, that's maybe obvious from if you look from the commercial side or your work side to do, do it like that. But even for your hobby project, it can be very sort of uh, pay off really well. It's, it's worked really well when we're adding new functionality or we're changing some of the plumbing in the system. Um, you know, you go in, you do some surgery, and then you run the tests. And sometimes six to ten tests will fail. And you find there, you know, it tends to be they're all interconnected. And it leads you back to the single source. You fix that. And, you know, it, it could be an edge case and off by one or sometimes it's an assumption about the way something is used and it's not actually always true and so Matt's is really good at um you know identifying some of those scenarios and uh you know keeping us honest i guess i would say um so i i love i, I run it as much as i before you know even before i commit something uh, so I get to see, you know, if anything has progressed. So yeah, I, I really recommend this process to people. You know, I haven't seen it done. I, I don't think that I don't know any other package that has done it to this level. And um, you know, it's been working really great for us. And I think 
you know, well, we'll stay tuned when we, we release to the general public. Right? But Bob, also maybe test the test part of different packages is not the first thing you look at. So I know there are packages that have testing, a lot of testing, but how much much testing they have or not, I don't know. It's not what you normally look into when you look at someone else's code. You look right. maybe on the functionality side, but not on how they done the, the sort of the quality side. But right. so so there there could be other packages out there that are, that are well equipped. So. I hope so. What's the craziest bug you found when writing these tests? <clears throat> well, what brings to my mind just now is that we were doing some tests, or I were doing some tests for uh, when you uh, n narrow, what do you say that? When you. Uh, in outlining when you sort of uh, collect, compress things in an outline, so you just, you can, sorry, Bob, you maybe have it, what I'm hide. looking for? When you hide, hide text. Yeah, when you hide, when you hide. So I, I was doing some cursor movement over that, and I always assume that if you do like a, uh, a prefix argument to like a simple cursor movement, like control F moving one character position, and you would give it the, uh, 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 and and, and uh, so, so, so prefix like you want to move like two or three uh, positions you would do like control U three and then control F and you move three I always assume that that would be exactly the same as if you just hit the key control F three times but it's not so it's not the bug it's it's a feature but that was the craziest thing I spent the night uh, trying to figure out why our, why our code was wrong but it turns out that's how Emax behaves. Try it out yourself. Move, try, try to move over the three dots at the end of that and see what happens. Do it with cursor hitting the key or using the, uh, a prefix argument and you see it behaves differently. That was the craziest thing. I think there was some other crazy thing or, or deep learning also, but I can't come up with it at the moment. So maybe I can write it in the Q&A later. I think we're out of time on the stream, but people are welcome to join Mats and Bob here on Big Blue Button to further discuss this. Thank you both. Okay, thank you. Thanks, my guy. Thank you. I don't know. It, is it only me and Bob here? So, Bob, do you <laughs> want to say something? <laughs> uh, well, I think it's uh, it's been a great day. And, you know, I'm glad we did this. It takes a lot of energy, but, um, you yeah. know, um, so, so. Um, you know, I'm, I'm just really excited about the, the progress that this and, you know, we're actually, you know, we're doing a lot of QA at work in my professional uh, software work and uh, looking at you know, how we can do more test-driven development. And um, so everybody's talking about this, you know, we've got AI over here that can generate test cases. And But, you know, strangely enough, with the rapidity of development and web applications, I think the level of testing has gone down in recent years compared to where it used to be, right? Because the pace has gone up. And, and so I think, it's starting to turn again, where people are saying, you know, we can't just release crap into the webosphere, um, and we have to, we have to better, better ourselves. And with with all these advanced uh, tool sets that you have, that you can do CI/CD testing. Um, you know, I just, I just see it coming around. You know, as people develop new things, so that's kind of exciting to me because I came from a manufacturing culture originally where we our company actually started a lot of the manufacturing quality efforts that you saw in japan and, and elsewhere in america for a long time and that was you know entirely through testing we used to just uh, build incredible uh, test cases because we were combining software with hardware 
and it, you know, the hardware doesn't work, and you ship a million units, you're you're in trouble. Um, so um, that was just something we had to do, and so it's nice to start to see that that curve um, kind of come around. And I think, uh, you know, Matt Matt's is very modest, but uh, I think uh, he's he's really the one that uh, started us down this path and, and really made it into a reality. So uh, everybody else just gets to, to benefit from that work. So thanks. Thanks. That's awesome. OK. Yeah. That's... So if there's nothing more here, then Maybe we should just close this and I go over to write in the Etherpad the replies we had. Right. Yeah, I think, um, let's see, I see one other person here. I believe Ihor just yeah. joined us. Um, yeah, so if you do want to discuss uh, with Mats and Bob, you're welcome to. Otherwise, yeah, we can yeah. close this room down. Well, let's... I think I missed most ah. of the talk because I had power outages. But uh, the part I heard was about the mock mock library mm -hmm. and you mentioned that you don't like cl uh, latv but instead you use mock yeah i was more uh, i was more saying that uh, you have to do a lot of more work when you use the cl latv it's for more ambitious and then maybe more complicated cases where you want to really make any new implementation uh, test implementation if you use the mock you get a lot of things out of the box uh, verifying that you actually like the mock was actually called for instance whereas if you do with the clf you would have to take track track of that yourself and and uh, so so uh, for example, a, lot, a lot of more work oh yeah hmm? I'm saying that most of the time CLS is used like, for simple cases actually, because we just for example want uh, the function always return the same, and it, then it will be simple lambda that ignores all the input arguments. So that's that's really trivial most of the time. But I, I actually thought the opposite that mock is supposed to be used for non-trivial cases. Sorry, once again, uh, mock was supposed to be used for. Non-trivial. Yeah, I mean, uh, 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 well, uh, I don't know how to explain this. I mean, CLTF can be used for non-trivial, definitely. You, you, you can define then any behavior you want. You can write your own function, but you need to keep track of whether that function is called or not, for instance. So you have to make your, make, make, uh, um, make note of that the function was called, so you can fire a, a, sort of an error in case you, your function wasn't called, because that that, that would be one uh, okay, error case. Okay, so for, you, you mean the mock fires an error if your, the mocked function was actually not called? Yes, okay. it does. Yes. So 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 uh, <clears throat> so so if your assumptions. Uh, you sort of document uh, with the mock also your assumption on how how your code is going to be called, and and if if those are wrong, you will get an error. So you will so so if the implementation would maybe change, for instance, and not call the thing you're mocking, then uh, uh, you you will notice that. But if you use CLF, then you will have to keep track of that yourself. Okay, I see. I see. And you know, work mode also uses a lot of uh, ERC tests. And so we, Sorry? we mostly use in our mode. We use a lot. We have a lot of tests also. Ah, okay. Yeah, yeah. And I'm not sure you have. I, I have. You rely on CLLAT for. You know, don't use third-party libraries at all. Oh, you you use CLLATF? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, f at first I found it very powerful to use that, but then I sort of uh, I, I learned more about how we can use the uh, the mocking library for for uh, what I needed, and uh, I, I prefer that at the moment. I see that that is interesting because I, I have seen it, but I didn't consider that, that it's it's going to be useful even in simple cases. 
Thanks. Yeah, it, it has its it has its limitations. So it, it it's it's like life. How you turn depends. <laughs> But may, maybe I should look more into your the org mode and the test cases there to learn more about that. So thanks for pointing that out. We we are trying to like cover as much as we can. Well, it is almost impossible for org, but <laughs> yeah, we, we, we keep adding more tests. Mm -hmm. That's great. Someone's typing. <laughs> well, sorry, that's me. Uh, well, if I'm gonna. So, I don't know. Any more questions? No. Okay, then. Then I'll go back and try to document this in the Etherpad. And thank everybody for joining. Great. Thank All you, right. guys. Great one. Thank you. Take care. Bye, bye. Take care. Bye.